so today's lecture is going to be, um, was actually originally supposed to be a single lecture. Uh, but when I was working over the slides this weekend, I realized that it's kind of hard to cram everything I wanted to talk about in a single class. Uh, so I, I ended up breaking it into to, to two lectures. Um, this is sort of the last part of the, of the course that will be about what I'll call you know, theory, theory in quotes. Uh, meaning we're not talking about system implementation issues. We're talking about sort of some high level concepts. And the, the thing that we really care about is what we'll cover on Wednesday, which is called the normal forms. And the reason why it's actually worth talking about, even though this, this course is supposed to be a systems course, the reason why it's actually talking about, worth talking about the normal forms is because this is one of the, the, uh, one of the concepts that the NoSQL guys will use to argue well, why their approach is better than the relational model approach or the relational databases. Uh, there'll be two aspects of it. It'll be that they're going to denormalize everything, and again, you'll learn what that is on, on Wednesday, and as well, they're going to give up some of the asset guarantees of your transactions, which we'll learn about later in the semester. So in order to understand you know, whether, you know, and, and reason about whether their justification for denormalizing their database is correct, you actually need to know what the normal forms are. So, but the problem is, in, in order to understand the normal forms, you have to understand schema, schema decomposition. To understand schema decomposition, you have to understand functional dependencies, which is why we're going to spend today talking about sort of the first part of the precursor to understanding uh, the background information, which you need to understand the normal forms, the functional dependencies. So it's a bit dry, it's a bit theory-esque, uh, but again, I, I think it's important. So the, the goal of this week is for us to understand and, and, and reason about what it means to have a good database schema, a good database design. And when I say you know, good database design, I mean the, sort of the high level logical construct of our schema. I'm not talking about you know, what data structures we use, what algorithms we're going to use and, you know, to do joins and things like that. That's called physical database design. That, we're not worried about that until later. This is, again, this is at the higher level. This is you as the application programmer need to define the schema in order to store data in your database. So this was, we're dealing with this at the logical level. And so there's two issues or two, two ways we can define the goodness of a schema. The first is that we want to make sure that we don't lose any data, right? That we have uh, sound database integrity, meaning we put data in, we get that same data out. Then we also want to get good performance. So we're not going to focus on this just now in, in this class or on Wednesday. It'll come up in, in, in certain cases when we talk about uh, assertions. But for us, we're not worried about you know, how fast our databases can perform based on our schema just yet. We really care about the, 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 the first issue, right? Because it would be bad if to put data into a database. You're storing a bank, and you have everyone's bank information. You put data in, and you don't get that same data out, right? People get pissed when you start losing their money. Um, this idea of sort of correctness versus performance will come up again when we talk about transactions. Uh, and the relational database purists, which I consider myself uh, in that camp, would be like, yeah, of course you want to run everything with full protections and full data integrity. Um, you will, we'll worry about performance later. Whereas like the NoSQL guys, for example, would say, oh, no, 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 we, we care about scalability, we care about performance, and we'll, we're okay if some of your data gets lost or some of your data gets, gets, gets dirty. So for today, we're going to focus on the integrity side of things, but then this, this will be a sort of a reoccurring theme that comes up throughout the semester of this trade-off between you know, uh, in the integrity of your database versus the performance of the action transactions you want to run on, run on it. So let's look at a toy example here. So let's say that we have a database of keeping track of, of all the students taking class, classes in our university, and we just put everything in our database into a single relation, a single table. So the single relation called student has the student ID, the course ID that they took, the room that the class was taught in, their, and the name and the address of the student. Right, so we just took everything that we could have in our application and we just threw it into our, our single database. So what are some problems with this? Yes. Right. So, right. so we have data duplication here, right? So well, the first thing we have is we have, we're duplicating the room number for the course all over again. And then the thing he pointed out is that we're duplicating the Obama record, right? Because Obama took two classes. And so we have to duplicate his name and duplicate his address. 
So this is an example of, of, of a relation that we can reason about the, the, the properties of it based on how, you know, whether we have duplicate data and whether we have other issues. And so the, this boils down to this idea of redundancy in our, in our schema, or redundancy in our database. And this can then, because we have redundant information, there are some certain anomalies that can occur because of this. The first is that we can have an update anomaly where if the room number changes for a course, then we need to go through and make sure that we update all the records of the students that took that course and update their room numbers. And the database system can't, you know, you can, you can finagle it to do this for you automatically, but there's no declarative way to do this, make sure that you update one record and it propagates that updates to any copies of it. Because it doesn't know that the, the value of that record, of that attribute, is, should be the same or linked together with other, uh, other values in different tuples. The second problem is that we have, we, it makes it tricky to do inserts. So in my example that I showed before of the giant single table, every student had to be enrolled in a course, right? Because I couldn't put a student in without having a course ID. So that means that if you're a new graduate student or new, new freshman and you show up to our university, you're not even on the registered role until you actually register in a course. The question is, of course, how can you register for a course if you're not a student, right? So this, this, this is the problem here. And the last one is that if now we delete all the students that are enrolled in the course, the, that course information essentially gets, disappears, right? So if I delete all the students that are enrolled in the course, then I lose the room number because all the records for those students had the room number in it, right? So Ideally, what we actually want to do is something like this. We'll, we'll split up or decompose a, a, that giant single relation into sort of sub-relations, and then they'll be linked together based on the student ID. So this now provides us the independence that we need to avoid all the anomalies that I just talked about in the last slide. Right? I can insert students into the student table without them being registered in a course. Uh, I can add a, a, a the, a course to my list of rooms and provide a room number even though there's no student enrolled in it yet. And then I can have uh, students have a grade uh, whether or not they're enrolled in the course or not. So the, the, the student table and the rooms table or relations are now independent of each other and we can avoid these anomalies. Furthermore, we, have, we don't have a duplicate information anymore, right? We only have Obama once and if we need to update his address, we only have to update a, a single tuple. So this is called decomposition. And this decomposition of, of, that, of that original relation I showed you before is better, right? And it's sort of obvious to us as humans to look at this, yeah, this is the better way to do it. But the goal for this lecture is actually to understand at a more fundamental le level why it's better. Can we reason about in a more principled manner why this is better than, than, than the first one? So that's sort of the, the goal of what we're trying to achieve today. So to do this, the first thing we need to cover are functional dependencies. These are essentially constraints that you have within attributes within a single tuple. And then from them, we can start computing what's called the canonical cover, which is the minimum set of functional dependencies you need to reason about whether an instance of a schema is correct. And then uh, I'll, I'll keep track of time because I want to focus on, I want to spend some time at the end talking about the first project which is going out today. Um, but we'll cover now using functional dependencies to perform decompositions of schemas. If we, if we cover everything, great. If not, it'll roll over into Wednesday's class, and then we'll, it'll, it'll, it'll lead into when we start talking about the, the normal forms. All right, so a functional dependency is part of the relational model. And it's essentially a form of a constraint and that defines the, the value of one attribute is implied by the value of another attribute. And you write it sort of, and you define them like this, x implies y, x arrow y. So this is saying that the value of the attribute x for a tuple functionally defines the value of the attribute y. And so more formally, you can sort of uh, write it like this. But the basic idea is that if we have two tuples, right, and they both have attribute x and y, for the first tuple, if it has a certain value for x, then it'll have a certain value for y. And if that other tuple has the same value for x, it has to have that same value for y. Right? Let's look at an example. So say we have our relation. We just have the student ID, the name, and the address. And the student ID is the primary key for this relation. 
So we know that we have a functional dependency from student ID to name. Right? And this is saying that the student ID implies the value of the student ID attribute implies the value of the name attribute in the tuple. Right? In this case here, it's sort, of, it's sort of trivial because the student ID is the primary key. So there can be one and only one value of a student ID in the entire relation. And for each single tuple with that student ID, it's going to have a single, a single name. Right? So again, the student ID implies the name for this. But you may be thinking, like, all right, now I look at this particular example here, and I can see other possible functional dependencies, right? right? So this is valid, but I also maybe have something like this. Maybe I could say the name implies address. So certainly for this instance of this schema, or instance of this relation, remember the schema defines the, so the, the logical, con the logical um, conception of a relation. And then an instance of a relation is the actual the you know the the, tu the real tuples that get stored in the actual table itself. So for this particular instance, this uh, this functional dependency holds because there's only four students. They all have a unique name and they all have a unique address, right? But we can't always assume that this is going to hold for any possible instance of this relation, because if, if a new student comes along, it's me back in back in grad school. So if I start my record with my name Andy, I have a different student ID, so that's valid. And for, and for whatever reason, I had my, my address back in the East Coast, right? This function dependency no longer holds anymore because I now have two, value, two tuples with the value Andy, and they each have a uh, different address. So in actuality, we can't make any claims about functional dependencies uh, just seeing a single instance of, of a relation, right? We have to be told that this instance, or sorry, we have to be told that this schema has this functional dependency, right? And we'll, we'll use some logic later on to actually extrapolate additional functional dependencies, but we want to make sure that we follow the rules for how we do this so that we don't have incorrect things here. Right, so there's some tricks you can do, uh, we'll see in a second, of how to derive and, 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 and extrapolate additional functional dependencies. But there's some, short, some easy tricks to do things like x implies y and x implies z. So therefore, you can write it as x implies y and z. So you can combine things on the right-hand side, but you can't do the reverse for the left-hand side. So if you have x and y implies z, it's not correct to say x implies z and y implies z. Because you have to have the unique combination of x and y together in order to, to imply z. So you, you, can, you, can, you can explode the, the right-hand side. You can't explode the left-hand side. All right, so these seems like these are kind of interesting. And uh, as I said, they're part of the original relational model. So it's not any surprise that this is actually in the, in, in the SQL standard. Yes? So when you say x implies y, is it necessary always that x should be a primary key? Because if x is not a primary key, then you can always have two doubles with x. So his question is, if I'm saying x implies y, does that implicitly mean that x is the primary key? No. These are functional dependencies that are outside of what you're defining as the primary key. Right? We'll talk about indexes later, but you can define unique indexes that aren't the primary key. Right? But we're not even talking about primary keys at this point. Right? It's just saying that this functional dependency has to be held true. Now, it may be the case that often what you define as your functional dependencies will end up being the primary key, but it's not always the case. And actually, to be more, to be more exact, they will be the candidate key or the super key, which we'll get to that in a few slides. All right, so as I said, uh, the functional dependencies were part of the, of the original relational model. And in the SQL standard, you can actually define uh, constraints or assertions that essentially act the same as ways of functional dependency. So here we can say our simple function dependency of the, of the student ID implies name. In the SQL standard, we can call create assertion. And then we have our check clause where we specify what query you want to run uh, anytime you want to validate this, the, the instance of our database. And as long as this thing returns uh, false, or sorry, returns true in our check statement, which means that this query has to return false, then we know that our, our our, relate, our instance of our relation, our table, is, is valid. Right? And you sort of extend this and do more complicated things. Say you want to do the student ID implies name and student ID applies address. 
then we can just add in uh, an additional uh, disjunctive clause in our where clause inside the, the check statement to make sure that for if there's two students with the same student ID, they don't have the same name or they don't have the same address. And again, every single time that you insert, update, or delete, or tuple, it will run this to check to see whether your instance is valid and throw an error if it's not. Yes? Is this um, notably different than like, the unique specifier for the attribute? <coughs> so his, que his question is, is this notably different than using the, the unique attribute? And the answer is yes. Because this can be an arbitrary query. I'm showing a simple example where I'm only doing query on one table, but it can be anything. It can, can be multiple tables, it can be you can do joins, you can do whatever you want. Just, it always has to return true anytime you, you modify the table. It's a good question. All right, so there's two problems with this, with these assertions. Let me take a guess what they are. In the back, yes. Excellent, yes. So he said it has to run through the entire table every single time to check to see whether this is valid. Right, so he's absolutely right. So if I update a single tuple in the students table, I have to run this query again and check to see whether it, the instance is still hold, whether I'm even allowed to make that particular change. So this is only accessing a single table, but if you were doing a join, sort of the example that he brought up, now you got to do a join between two, two different tables or multiple tables. Now you can try to say, all right, maybe I could be a little bit smart about this and say, oh, well, I can reason that I'm only, uh, I'm only doing a query on the students table, so anytime anybody inserts, updates, deletes the students table, I'll only run this assertion. If you update the other tables, I don't care. Or then you may say, I mean, a little bit smarter, maybe I only run this for the tuples that I actually got, mo got modified, right? Yes, you could try to do that, but the, you know, you have to be pretty sophisticated in order to make it work. And it's hard to do this for, for other things. Like if you have an aggregation, then you have to run it for everything. I, I can put any arbitrary query I want in this check statement. Let me take a guess what the second problem is. Uh, you know, it has to be a select statement. It has to return true. So you can't. Yeah, you could have, yeah, yes. UDS could do this, yes. But we're not there yet. Anybody else? No, this actually supports this, right? It's in the SQL standard, right? Uh, here's, the, here's the standard from 1992. It says, yeah, it's great. Here's an assertion. Here's what it can do. Uh, but as far as I know, no database system actually supports that create assertion syntax. Right? If you Google this, it'll show up in a textbook you know, written in 1999 or so about the SQL 99 standard. It says, oh, here's all the syntax to do this. Uh, there's an there's a online poll ran by Oracle on their, on their DBA website asking in 2016, hey, we're thinking about adding these global assertions. Would you guys actually want it? And of course, everyone says yes, but I don't think it actually got implemented. Uh, again, as far as I know, no database system actually supports this. You can finagle it sort of using unique constraints or triggers and other things, but the create assertion syntax, as I showed before, it does not actually work anywhere. So the closest thing I could find uh, was in DB2, where in the create table syntax, you can add a constraint where you specify that the value of a single attribute will be determined by another single attribute. So in this case here, if I want to define the functional dependency, student ID implies name, I define my, uh, my constraint and I say check the value of name and it's determined by the value of student ID to make sure it's, it's a unique match. Now, you could also make this in the way that he sort of talked about where you can make a unique constraint of student ID and student name together and that way you always have a unique combination but it's not exactly the same. So again, these are nice to have, uh, but you actually can't really use them widely. So now the question is, why do I care? Right, if you can't use them in SQL, why am I wasting your time sitting and talking about them? Well, again, as I said in the beginning, we're going to need these functional dependencies to actually determine whether our database design is correct. By database design, I mean taking our, the relation that we're given and deciding how to decompose it into, into sub-relations. And then this is a completely separate decision from whether we're actually going to get good performance or not, right? We care about the integrity of our data. So if we're given a bunch of provided uh, functional dependencies, 
we actually want to now derive what are called implied functional dependencies. So I showed that example before where, where I, I said, well, you can map the name to the address, and I said that was not valid because it may look correct for that particular instance of the database, but it's not correct for all possible instances of that, for that schema or that relation. But now with these implied dependencies, we can rely on our uh, provided dependencies and extrapolate new ones and kind of condense them down to a, a more simple form. So we're given, again, the student ID implies name and address. And again, because of the transitivity rule, we can say that student ID implies name and student ID implies address. For shorthand notation, we're combining them together. And then we have student ID and course ID together implies the student's grade in the course. So as, as I'll show in a, in a second, you can actually derive additional uh, functional dependencies from these. Right? So if you have student ID and course ID implies grade, then you also have sort of basic things like student ID, course ID implies the student ID, student ID, course ID implies the course ID, right? and, all, and all these kind of things here. And we're going to use these to, again, to later reason about uh, our, our decompositions. So now what we want to do is now we want to say, given a set of functional dependencies, we want to decide whether we have a new functional dependency is actually valid for, for, for that set, for that schema. And so for this, we can compute what's called the closure. So I think this is like an explosion, the closure is the explosion of all possible implied dependencies given our provided functional dependencies. And we're going to use what are called Armstrong's axioms to do this. So I don't want to go through the nitty gritty details of how all this works. All of you have sh should have taken some basic logic course or, or discrete math at some point in, in your life. And so these are, are, are pretty obvious and pretty straightforward, right? right? If you have x and y, x implies y, you throw z in there, x, z implies y, z, right? S simple things like that. So we're going to use these six rules to take our provided functional dependencies and compute the closure, the implied ones. Right? So let's do this. So let's now, so again, a function dependency, set of functional dependencies f defined by f1 to fn. And we want to define what's called the closure, which is, is F plus, the syntax we'd use for this. Right? So we take our, our schema and our, our two given uh, provided functional dependencies, and then we can derive all the implied ones using Armstrong's axioms, right? the rules I showed in the last, in the last slide. Right? Again, these are pretty straightforward. And then, again, the combined total of all the implied functional dependencies is called now the closure. Now you're like, why do I care about the closure, right? So if you have the closure of functional dependencies on the relation, then now you can compute the, what's called the attribute closure, which is the attribute closure is where you say, for a given attribute x, you want to find all the attributes that can be inferred from x in, your, in that schema. So think of it. So if I, if I have a value of x, and I have attributes a, b, and c in, in my tuple, if I have x, then I, based on the functional dependencies and computing the closure, I know that I can get y, so I can get a, I can get b, I can get c. So that's what the attribute closure is, we can derive from the total closure of, of the functional dependencies. So again, to check to see whether we have x implies y, we can compute the closure on x, and then we check to see whether the attribute is inside of the attribute closure on x. So again, why do you care about the attribute closer? Right? So as we said in, in earlier, we said that computing the, checking all the constraints or functional dependencies every single time we modify a relation or a table is really expensive to do. So ideally what we want is we want to get a minimal set of functional dependencies that we have to check in short, to make sure that our relation is actually correct. So again, the idea is that you're, you could be given a bunch of functional dependencies all right, think of this as like your, the, your database designer or your application developer says, here's the database we want, we want to set up just to store data for our new application. And they're going to define all these functional dependencies. Uh, but there may be some redundancies. There may be some extra stuff that maybe you don't need to care about so much. So you want to compute uh, the closure and then find the minimal set of functional dependencies from that that you only need to enforce. So that way you're not wasting time checking things you don't care about. Question in the back? So this question is, can you have circular dependencies? Yes. We'll see that in a second. But when you compute the minimal set, which, which is called the canonical cover, you will remove these circular dependencies. So 
the minimal set of functional dependencies that you derive from the closure is called the canonical cover. And you'd use the syntax of defining f of c. Right? So you say, given a set of functional dependencies f, defined here, we want to come up with what's the minimum we actually need. So the, these four here are what were provided. And then using Armstrong's axioms, we can fi find out that only these first two here are the ones we actually care about. Right? And, it, and it's pretty simple to see this. Right? So given a student ID and name for the, for the third one, I get the name and the address. Well, again, we know from transitivity that if you have the name here, you also have the name there. So it's implied that uh, the student ID can give you the name. But then that's the same as up here, because we can explode those out into uh, to single, a single attribute uh, functional dependencies. Yes? So his question is, is the canonical cover always going to be as, for a given relation with, with a set of functional dependencies, will the canonical cover always be the same? My hunch is yes. I think yes. So yeah, I think the answer is yes. Because you, you can keep repeating the process we'll show in the next couple of slides, keep refining it to get it down to a smaller set, and I think you should always end up with the same thing. Is that true? Yeah, I think that's true, yes. OK. All right, so how do you compute the canonical cover? Right? Well, the first thing we got to understand, what are, what are the properties we need to hold in our canonical cover? And for this, in the shorthand notation, I'll say uh, right-hand side, left-hand side is implied here by, by this particular example. So the canonical cover will be one where the right-hand side of every functional dependency in, in our set is always going to be a single attribute. And then the closure of the function of, of the canonical cover has to be identical to the closure of the of the original provided functional dependency set. So again, the closure is the one where we use Armstrong's axioms to sort of explode the number of functional dependencies that we have. And we, the canonical cover will be one where if you take the closure of the canonical cover and the closure of the original set, they have to be they have to be equivalent. And then we'll say that our canonical cover is the minimal set, because if we eliminate any attribute from either the right-hand side or left-hand side of any functional dependency in our canonical cover, then the closures of, of the canonical cover will no longer be equivalent to the original functional set. So this is a bit dry, but we, we, we walk through an example. So the way we're going to compute this is basically for every single uh, set of functional, uh, functional dependencies that we have, we're going to drop either a attribute on the left-hand side, or the right-hand side, or remove any redundant functional dependencies, um, and make sure that any functional dependency only has a single attribute on the right-hand side. And we're just keep doing this over and over again until we can't do it anymore. So let's walk through an example. So say I'm given these four functional dependencies: a, b implies c, a implies b, c, b implies c, and a implies b. So the first thing we can see is that. We want to re remove the number of, or we want to split up any functional dependencies where on the right-hand side they have two attributes. And again, we said we could do this based on Armstrong's axioms, that we can take A implies B, C, and we can split them up so that be A implies B and A implies C. Right? Those, are two, those, those are equivalent. So now we have five functional dependencies. So now we no longer have any uh, attributes or any any functional dependencies where the, the right-hand side has two attributes, so now we want to apply our other rules to try to find redundancies. So the first thing is obvious here. We have the functional dependency A implies B twice, so we can go ahead and remove one of them. All right? That's pretty easy. Then we come back around here, and now we see that we have a circular dependency that he was talking about before. So we have A implies C, and then A implies B, and B implies C. And so in this case here, if you have A, then you can get B. But if you have B, then you can get C. So it's trivial that if you have A, then you can get C. So we can remove the, the, first, the first guy. All right? And now the same thing, same thing here. So now we want to try to remove the, the number of, we we'll remove any uh, functional dependencies with more than one attribute on the left-hand side. So in this case here, we have A, B implies C, and then below that we have A implies B. So if you have A, you have B. So 
obviously, if you have A implies A and B implies C, that's basically B B implies C, and so you, you can remove the A from the first one. And now we obviously see that we have another you know set of functional dependencies that are redundant, so we can go ahead and remove the first one. Can we go any further? No. All right. So we can go through now the checklist that we had to have. And when we define what our properties are for our canonical cover, uh, and we can say, well, the first one is that we know there's nothing extraneous, right? There's no you know, redundant uh, uh, functional dependencies. Uh, all of the attributes on the right-hand side are th on, on the, of these functional dependencies are only a single attribute, right? We don't have B implies C and A, right? It's all single, single values. And the last one is that if we then explode the, uh, our, our final set here, and get, and get the closure, it will be equivalent to the closure of the original set of functional dependencies that we were provided. We're not going to do it, but like, you take my word for it. So if we, once you have this, once you've satisfied these three properties, voila, you have the canonical cover. And in, in the back, yes, raise your hand higher so I can see it. Yeah, so that's so you can remove you can remove those. You can remove one of them. Yeah, you, you could have that. Yeah, why not? His question is if you have A implies B and B implies A. Yeah, I think actually you're right. You have, you have to keep those. His question is does that make sense? In terms of what? Like the application? So, it, so in our rules, that's a valid, so his question is, if you have A implies B and B implies A, is that allowed? The answer is yes. The second question is, does that make sense to have? It depends on the application, right? We're just dealing with this in, a, in an abstract sense, right? We're not, we don't know what the actual data is in our database. We don't actually know what they're trying to model in their application. So technically that's correct, right? Think of this, like, um, you know, I have one email address, I'll have one social security number. If you have my social security number, you can get my email address. If you have my email address, you can get my social security number. That's correct. Question? Okay. So, again, we're not... In terms of whether that's, these functional dependencies are the right thing to do, we don't care. The application told us. Right? The application developer, the design of the database told us this is what they wanted. This is what they wanted our database system to enforce then it's up to us as people taking this course who actually build the database system to actually enforce this for them in a, an efficient manner. But as I said, no database system supports assertions, so nobody does. Okay, so again, I'm seeing, you know, it's a lot of blank faces, everyone's sort of going through this, going through the motions with me, so why do you actually really care now about the canonical cover? Well, as I said, the canonical cover will be the minimal number, minimum number of assertions that we need to, to maintain and enforce in our database to make sure that the data is actually correct. And as he sort of said, you know, we don't care whether, uh, whether truly in the grand scheme of things, right, in reality, whether the data is actually correct. It's, it ha it's correct in, in the context of the relation that they defined of these functional dependencies. So now, if you have the canonical cover, you can find what's called the super key. And this is not a term that I made up. This is not a sort of fake term. This is a real term that was, again, defined in the relational model in the 1970s. So I'm going to go through three different definitions of the super key to try to, to, try to hammer this, this down. Uh, if, if you Google super key, you'll find a bunch of different things, but it's really hard for me to, to distill down exactly what it is. So I'll go through the mathematical term, and then I'll go finish up with what, you know, to, from the system side of thing, what, what it looks like. So the super key is defined as the set of any attribute in the relation, of any attributes in the relation that can be used to functionally determine the attributes of all, all the attributes in, in that tuple for that given relation. So if I have, say, the most trivial super key would be all the attributes. 
because all of the attributes can then be functionally used to determine the value of all the attributes. All right? Related to this is the candidate key, which we sort of talked about before, which is any super key where if you remove just one of the attributes, then you can no longer functionally determine all of the other attributes. So now you're thinking, well, what's the difference between a super key and a candidate key? Well, again, try to, to put it in other terms. Think of the super key as having a, uh, a set of attributes where there's no tuples that, uh, two distinct tuples that will have the exact same values for those attributes. But then this candidate key will be the set of attributes that are uniquely defined and identify a single tuple according to some functional dependency or, or key constraint. So a candidate key is a super key, but not all, not all super keys are candidate keys. Again, more blank faces. Let's try again. Okay. So the super key is the set of attributes that uniquely identify a tuple. It can be one, it can be all, it can be anything, right? The candidate key is the minimal set of attributes that we have that can uniquely identify a single tuple. So again, if I have 10 attributes, one super key could be all those 10 attributes. But the candidate key could just be just one of them. And that's enough for me to identify the, the tuple and get the values for all the other ones. And then so the primary key essentially is just usually just the candidate key. Yes? This question is, why do you need a super key? I don't know. This is what the, this is the math says. The math, relational model paper says you have the super key and there's candidate keys, and they're distinct. His question is, is a candidate key a subset of the super keys? Yes. If you take, it's, it's the minimum. If you take away one attribute from, from the candidate key, then you can't find everything else. Right? Trivially, like if, if, you're, if you have a single attribute that's, that's the candidate key, and if you remove that single attribute, you can't find anything. Right? That's like the, the extreme case. Um, in the example before where I had the student ID and the, and the course ID to find all the, the student's information, if you remove the course ID, then you can no longer uniquely identify an instance of, of, of a student taking a course. Yes? Can you have multiple candidate keys? The question is, can you have multiple candidate keys? Yes. <clears throat> okay. But why do you care about super keys? Right? Again, they're going to be used for us to determine when it's okay to decompose or split up a table into subtables. And these super keys are going to allow us to ensure that we, that we can always go back and get the original data we had in our, in our relation. So we need these to, to, to reason about whether our decomposition or, or, or normalization is what it's called, of splitting up these tables was the right thing to do or not. Yes? If there's a primary key in the schema, you can't have multiple candidate keys, right? This question is, if you have a primary key in the relation, you can't have multiple candidate keys. No. Because you can, again, you can define unique keys um, that are independent of the primary key. We can pop open Postgres and do this now. Like, they're separate. The, can I mean, the primary key, as I said sort of the beginning, is like, I don't think it's actually defined in the original relational model. But it's in practice, this is what everyone does. This is what, like, there's no super key or candidate key uh, syntax in SQL. It's only primary key or unique keys. Um, and in practice, the primary key is sort of one anointed candidate key that, you, that is more important than the other ones. Well, I mean, the, why I have this question is that because the primary key uniquely identifies a tuple. Yes. The candidate key is a minimum set of attributes. So the primary key, if there is a primary key, it has to be the candidate. Yeah, but you can have two unique... I, I mean, I, I, I draw on the chalkboard. You can have... You could have a candidate key that has three attributes, and then another candidate key with another three attributes, and those both can uniquely identify the tuple. Right, but then you pick one of those, and that's the primary key. Make sense? And again, this is all defined by the application. 
we're given these functional dependencies, we're given the schema. We don't care about whether that's actually sound or correct from, from a sort of common sense standpoint. It's just whatever the application told us that it wanted it to do. Okay, so we care about super keys because we're going to use them to decompose our tables into multiple subtables, and then we want to use them to figure out uh, whether we, we were putting things together back to correctly. Yes, in the back. Can a candidate key spawn multiple tables? Multiple His question is, can a candidate key spawn multiple tables? Yes, we'll, we'll get there. Yes, a few slides. Correct, yes. The statement is that unique keys that you define in your table uh, are candidate keys. Does everyone know what a unique key is? All right, he's shaking his head no. All right, so we can pop them. Um, we can pop up in uh, Postgres again. All right. Can everyone see that? All right, so I can do things like create. Actually, what tables do I have here? All right, so I'll do create table foo or test. And I'll say it has a ID. That's an int. That's the primary key. Right? And then I'll have a value. That's an int. And I can say that this has to be unique. So that means that no two tuples can have the same primary key, or sorry, same, same value. Um, but I can also create a. Um, constraint where I say the ID, the combination of value, I think it's this. My syntax might be wrong. But like that, where I can say the combination of the ID and value together has to be a unique constraint. Yeah, that's not valid. So let's let's do this. Right? So now if I insert into test values one, two, that's allowed. If I do one three, will that fail? Yes or no? Why won't it fail? It should fail, right? Yeah, right. Duplicate key violates the primary key constraint. So now I say, say I do two three, that's allowed. Now I do three three, so that, does that fail? Right, because it violates that one. All right. So now we can also do now create, um, or I think it's. <coughs> This is probably not going to work either. I forget what the exact syntax is. Add unique constraint ID val. Nope. I think it's just create. Take my word for it. I have to look up the SQL standard, but there's a way to actually define a unique constraint that's a combination of multiple keys. Right? So actually, you can do this for the primary key too, right? So drop table test. If I go back and redefine it, um, and say I want the combination of ID and value together to be my primary key, so I can do primary key ID val, right? So now if I go back and do my example where I insert, say, 1, 3, that's OK. One three will fail again, right? Because we, du we duplicate our our combination of the primary key. So take my word for it. You can also define a non-primary key unique constraint that could be the combination of the two of them. So if they look the same, right? If they sort of act in the same way. Why is a primary key different than than a sort of regular unique key? Again, depends on how the database system does things internally. We're not. Well, we won't talk about this yet, but we'll talk about this later. So in the case of uh, MySQL, when you have secondary indexes, they actually store the primary key as the pointer to the actual tuple you want. And so if you, whatever you define as primary key, that gets embedded as the value for, the, for, the, for a secondary index. And then when you do a lookup in that secondary index, it looks, takes the, the primary key, then does a lookup in the primary key index to then actually find the tuple that you want. So there's, there's, it's more than just semantics that like, oh, it's, they're, they're, they're doing the same thing. Why do I care? Internally, the data system will do different things. But that's not defined in the SQL standard. That's all done you know, as, as how the system was built. OK, so now we can do schema decompositions. So 
a decomposition is where we're going to split a, rela a single relation into multiple subrelations. Um, and we want to make sure, we want to reason about what the properties are of, of, this, of this decomposition. So not all decompositions are going to make, are, are, are a good thing, or things we actually want to do. So remember the beginning of the class, I talked about the, the three different anomalies, the insert, up, insert, update, delete anomalies that we want to avoid. But then there's also this extra issue now of wasted space. So in that first example, I showed how we had duplicate Obama records. Right? We were duplicating Obama's address every single time. But now if we split up our, our relations into subrelations, now we need a way to know that these things are linked together. And now, because now we need to store the super key in order to com combine them to get back the original data. But now that may, 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 mean, may mean that we're storing the large super key over and over again in these different relations, which may end up being worse than, you, know, you waste more space than we had when, when we just had the duplicate records. So there are three goals we want to have in our decomposition. The first are called lossless joins. And this basically means that we don't want to lose any, any data when we join the tables back together. And so you know, if you think of like a sort of lossless algorithms or versus lossy compression algorithms, it's not exactly the same in that we're going to lose data. It's that we can introduce incorrect data and we actually lose the original form or the original content of, of our database. We also want to preserve dependencies. And this is related to the question he had up there, is that we want to make sure that we don't have dependencies span multiple relations, because then that means in order to enforce those constraints, we actually then have to do a join, which is expensive. So we want to minimize the, the sort of the cost of enforcing our global constraints based on our functional dependencies. But as I said before, nobody actually implements them, so it's, it's a moot point in some ways. And then the last one is that we want to we want to we want to avoid having redundant information, right? Because that just makes our database larger, it takes more space in memory, it takes more space on disk, and essentially costs us more. So of these three things, which, one, which, you got one, which ones do you guys think is the most important? Lossless joins, why? Yeah, you don't, you don't want to lose data, right? So this one is mandatory. And I say mandatory, though, actually coming from a Again, the, 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 a, a relational database, a relational model purist. I care about this a lot, right? And most people when you, you know, would say, yeah, I probably care about that too. Uh, the second two are nice to have, but not required. And we'll see this more when we talk about the normal forms, is that you could come up with a decomposition where you don't have any lossless joins, but you maybe don't, you don't you don't do so well in these other, other ones. And this last one here is actually kind of hard to find, redundancy d avoidance. There's no sort of exact term to say, yes, like, oh, I, I have zero redundancies, or I have low redundancies. It's sort of left up to the discretion of you as the database designer to decide what's the right amount of duplicate data you're allowed to have. Dependency preserving, again, as I said, nobody actually enforces these, so we don't care that much. But certainly the first one uh, can matter a lot, depending on your application. And again, we'll see this later in the semester when we talk about transactions, because they're exactly going to make this, this sort of same trade-off, right? So these ones at the bottom, they're nice to have, but they actually could make your database run slower. The one at the top will make your database run slower, but you make, you know, you, you, your database, your database is, is correct. And when we talk about transactions, they're going to make the same trade-off. We can run our, our queries and our application in a way that we're guaranteeing that everything is going to be correct, no matter what happens. And if we, if we crash, if we have two guys trying to update the same thing at the same time, we'll make sure that no matter what, it's always going to be correct. But in a lot of applications, people don't maybe care that much about correctness. And actually, by default, most databases don't run with full, full protection. Most people don't know, right? So this, what I say, in terms of context of, of schema design, this one is actually really important. Um, and the other ones are, you know, we'll talk about, but if you, if you achieve them, great. If not, it's not, it's not a big deal. All right, so let's look, what, let's look a little at what it means to have a lossless decomposition. So for this, I want to use another uh, relation, another example. This time we'll model a bank. And we'll have a start with a single relation that has the information about all the loans that this bank has, has, has made. And so we'll have the, the branch name of the bank, the city that the bank branch is located in, the current assets of that branch, and then 
the customer name, the loan ID, and the, and the amount of the loan, right? So we'll be provided with these functional dependencies seen up here. The branch name implies the city and the assets, and the loan ID implies the loan amount and the branch name. So let's say that we want to decompose this relation, we want, you know, it's, it's inefficient to have all this redundant information, right? If you see, we're duplicating the branch name and the city and the assets over again. So we want to try to decompose this in a way that reduces this redundancy. So for this, let's just pick the customer name as an example to do this, right? So we'll split up our single relation now into two separate relations that look like this. So now, if we want to take these two relations, and do a natural join and put them back together using the customer name, we end up with a table that looks like this. And what's obviously wrong about this? Right, exactly right. There's, there's two records here where I took a loan out in Compton for $1,000, and I have a loan in, in Pittsburgh for $500 that didn't exist that we had have, we have before. Again, because we're doing the natural join on the customer name. So this is an example of a bad decomposition. Right? We're, not even, we're not even talking about you know, violating the functional dependencies at this point. It's just we know that if we do a natural join and put these guys back together, we get, we get garbage. So this is bad. So let's say now instead we, try to, we, we decompose them based on the branch name. So the branch name can, uh, from the first table can be used to join together with the second table. And then we have the same problem, right? We, when, we do, when we do our natural join, we get now three records that didn't exist before, which is garbage data, right? So this, this is an example of a decomposition that's not lossless. So here's one that, that is lossless. So now if we split them up based on the loan ID, when we do our join and we, and we put it back together, we get exactly the, the, the same table that we had before. So this is, this, is, this is what we want to achieve when we decide how we want to split this up. And this is implying that the, the loan ID is, is our super key. OK, so this is good. We want this. All right, so the next thing we got to care about is dependency preservation. So it will say that a schema preserves its dependencies if the, each functional dependency does not span multiple tables or multiple relations. And the reason why we said this, this matters is because if we actually had true assertions, uh, we, could, we would have to do a join between two tables every single time either one of those two tables is, are, are modified. And again, we can implement this at the application level by running these queries you know, every single time to check to see whether things are correct. Uh, that would be even more inefficient. That would be bad to do. So let's look, look, go back to our, uh, the, the lossless one we had before, where we split it up on loan ID. And we see here is that the branch name implies the branch city. And to, to, um, to enforce that functional dependency, we'd have to do a join from the first table to the second table. Right? And that, that's, that's a bad thing. And then the same thing for the loan ID implies the amount and the branch name. We have to go back now in the other direction and do our comparison that way. So this is technically called not, this decomposition is not dependency preserving. Because the scope of each functional dependency exceeds one relation. And so to test this, uh, you have to, this is where now the, the canonical cover and the, and the closure comes into play. So we want to sort of mathematically test to see whether a decomposition can preserve the function dependencies. We first compute the uh, closure on the given set. Then we compute uh, a new set of function dependencies, G, that's a union of all of the sets covered by each, each subrelation. Then we compute the closure on G, check to see whether it matches the closure on F, and if they're equivalent, Voila, we know that we're, we're preserving our dependencies. So let's walk through an example like this. So we have two relations, R1, R2. R1 has A, B, C. R2 has C and D. And then we have three functional dependencies in our set. So then the first thing we do, we can we compute, we use Armstrong's axioms to compute the, uh, the closure on F. Then we take the, uh, compute this new set of, of functional dependencies, G, where the, the first 
item will be, first set will be the functional dependencies covered by R. And by covered, it just means that I have all the attributes that I need for that functional dependency in my relation. So A implies B. In, in R1, I have both attributes A and B, and therefore, that's covered by this. And the same thing for C and D, for R2. Then you compute the uh, closure on G, and then check to see whether it's equal to, to the closure on F. In this case, it's not because we have a functional dependency A implies D that is in the closure of F, but not the closure of G. So therefore, this, this decomposition is not dependency preserving. Take another example. So now, we, instead of having C in relation to R1, we'll put in D. And we just do all the same steps that we did before. I'm not going to go through in, in, in all the detail. But at the end, we, you'd find that the closure in F is equivalent to closure in G. So therefore, this decomposition is, is dependency preserving. All right, the last one is redundancy avoidance. Um, this is basically, uh, sort of, again, uh, you just basically say that if you have a functional dependency x implies y uh, that, is, that is within a subrelation and x is not considered to be the super key, then you're considered to have some duplicate data that you don't need because you, you could derive this from uh, another subrelation in your, in your decomposition. I'm not going to go through, the, through an example, but just take my word for one. This is what it means to have redundancies. All right. So just because this, this will show up on the exam, these are some nice slides that give you a, uh, for each of those three properties we care about, here's, here's why we want to do it, here's what you're trying to achieve, and then here's the, here's sort of the, the test or algorithm you can use to, to execute these. So we have losses joins, dependency preservation, and then our, our redundancy avoidance. For the sake of time, I'm going through this very briefly, but it's, you should read more about it in the textbook, and it'll show up in the homework that we give out on Wednesday. Okay, any questions? Okay, so that's all I have to say about functional dependencies at this point. They'll, they'll show up again, and these decompositions will show up again on Wednesday when we talk about the normal forms. Right? The normal forms are a way, they are different decomposition levels you can have for your relational schema that you can define based on those three properties that it showed. Lossless joins, dependency preservation, and redundancy. And in practice, you try to achieve uh, two possible levels of, of, of normal forms. There are ones that are below it and ones above it. Nobody really ca you know, cares about those guys too much. So again, what I talked about today is going to allow us to reason about our decompositions and to check to see what normal form a particular relational schema is in. So any questions about functional dependencies? In the back, yes. His question is, what is the complexity of determining whether something uh, preserves the functional dependency? Like the asymptotic complexity? Like, I mean, it, it, depend, it depends on, it depends on the, I mean, it's, it's, so it's not exponential, but it's not linear. It depends on what the functional dependency, what you're trying to check. And sometimes it also depends on the access method you want to, you want to use and how your database is physically designed. So if you have to scan every single tuple, then it's linear, right? Because it it's, depends on the number of tuples you have. But if there's a B plus tree, for example, that's n log n, so that's sublinear. Or sorry, log n. Uh, it depends. If you're joining a bunch of things together, then they have a different, different complexity. But again, think, so the reason why I think the major database vendors don't support assertions is because you could put any arbitrary query in there, and you'd have to go run that query every single time anybody modifies the tuple, or sorry, the table, or any table in your database possibly, and that would be really expensive to do. This will come up when we talk about transactions, but the longer you run your transaction, the more conflicts you're going to have and the slower your database is going to go. So it's typically why they don't, they don't want to do this. All right. And again, we've got to get through this, and we've got to get through normal forms on Wednesday. Then we can get to the good stuff, and then we can get to like actual building a database system. 
but I, I think this is important because you have to see normal forms at you know, some point in, in, your, in your academic career because they will probably arise, the question about, about you know, what's the right way to design a database will arise at some point in your life and then now you can say, oh yeah, normal forms, let me go read the Wikipedia page because you know, we talked about it 10 years ago. Okay? All right, so in the last 10 minutes, I'm going to talk about project one. So project one is going out today. The website is up. Uh, I think we're, in, after class, we'll post the actual uh, tarball you can download with the source code. But all the projects in this course will be on, the, the, the ultimate goal is that you're going to build your own storage manager in your database. Guys, it's <laughs> too much murmuring, okay, sorry. I don't know whether you're like, oh my gosh, this is terrible, or oh my god, this is so exciting, we're going to work on SQLite, but like, <laughs> you, can you can complain afterwards, okay? All right, so the goal of this semester is that you're going to build your own storage manager. And the storage manager is the thing that actually stores the database. And, you know, make sure that if you pull the plug on the, in, in on the system, and you come back and you, everything's still there. So the... The idea is that you're going to be building every, you know, four projects, you'll be sort of building upon each project and expanding what your storage manager can actually do. And so for the first project, you're going to be basically building the buffer pool manager, right? And the way you build your buffer pool manager is that you need, you know, sort of a hash table and you need some way to decide how to move pages in and out. So you're going to be building all the sort of those subcomponents. And you'll be, all the projects will be done in the context of SQLite, which is the, the most widely used database in the world, it's on everything, it's on your phone, it's in space, it's everywhere. Uh, and you're, you're not going to be actually hacking on the, you know, the real SQLite code because although beautiful as it is, it is very complicated. But they provide a nice API that sort of allows you to use SQLite as a front end and then it can call down into your, your storage manager that you guys are going to build to run queries and get data and, and update things, right? So, the project is, due, is, is going out today. I bumped up the, the due date to now be on October 2nd, right, because of the, the you know, because I split the normal form lecture into two classes, so everything's got, this project got slid up by one. Um, so just be, mindful, just be mindful of that. So there's three components you need to build. And you sort of, you roughly want to build them in, in this order. Again, please. Hey. Shh. I don't know, is it excitement or are you, are you angry about this? <laughs> is it excitement? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good, all right. <laughs> all right, so the first thing you need to build is an extendable hash table. So uh, uh, extendable hash table we'll cover, I think, uh, next week, is a type of hash table that allows for you to grow in size. So you don't have to define exactly how many elements you're going to store ahead of time. It has a method for actually expanding itself. And so you're going to want to build your hash table to store, store the use, so that, should, that should be unordered. Let me fix that real quick. So you want to store unordered buckets of, of, date, of key value pairs. Um, and then you'll follow the extendable hash algorithm to grow the hash table in size as you insert new, new elements. And so you're not going to need to support shrinking because uh, that's actually non-trivial to do. So you don't have to worry about you know, compacting your, and as you delete things, you, you give back memory. You only have to worry about growing. Um, and so for this, yes, you could use STL hash, hash, hash map in, in C++, plus, but it's kind of worth, you know, we want you guys actually to build your own. Um, and so you don't have to implement your own hash function. You should use ST, STD hash. And then you actually need to make sure that your hash table is thread safe because you can have multiple threads accessing your, your, your buffer pool manager and asking for, for, for entries. And so for this, you want to use std mutex. Uh, it's not, for this course, that's fine. If you take my advanced course in the spring, if you use std mutex, we'll, we'll fail you because they're actually really slow. Uh, I warned Joy about this for many years and he didn't believe me and we're still trying to remove them from our database system for the other one we're building. So for this, you can use std mutex, it's fine. Um, you, you need to make sure that your thread's safe. The next thing you need to build is the, what we'll call the LRU replacer. Basically, this is the, the component in the system that is responsible for keeping track of how pages are used. And we're just going to use least recently used LRU. 
And the idea is that when you run out of memory and you need to say, all right, I need to take a page and evict it from memory and write it back out the disk, which one should I use? This thing will tell you to use the last one that, that was, the one that has been, hasn't been used in, in the most recent amount of time. We'll discuss different uh, buffer pool uh, policy algorithms you can use uh, next week. But for this, we're using LRU because it's the most simple one. So the one thing you need to be mindful about in, in your implementation is that the buffer pool manager, which I'll show in the next slide, needs to keep track of what pages are pinned. Pin basically means that some thread says, I'm using this page. Do not write it out to disk. Uh, so the LRU uh, replacer you're going to build doesn't need to know anything about pinning things. right? It just needs to know, here's a page. It was used. And sort of update an internal data structure uh, to keep track of this. And it's up to you to decide for this, for this component whether you want to use your extendable hash table, whether you trust your own code. Uh, to use it inside the LRU, uh, LRU replacer, or you want to, you know, again, use SDL containers if you wanted to. And then the last thing you want to build is the buffer pool manager. So you're basically now taking the extendable hash table that, that you implemented before, and then the LRU replacer, and we'll provide you with the class file to drop these guys in. And this is the part of the system that answers requests from other threads running in the database system to say, I need, give me, you know, give me page one, two, three, give me page four, or give me a new page. I need to, need to write some data. And this thing is responsible for actually managing the database that's in memory. So the buffer pool manager essentially allows the database system to support databases that are larger than the amount of memory that's available to the system. Right? Because otherwise, if you, if you just take the entire database and suck it in memory, you can run really, really fast because you don't worry about anything getting written out the disk. And that's what the advanced class will, will focus on in the spring, because you can do. There's a lot of tricks you can do to make these things run really, really fast. Uh, whereas this course is sort of the classic disk-based database system. So this thing is basically using the LRU to figure out, all right, what if I need to make new space, what page was last used, or which which page has not been used in, in, the, in, in the nearest amount of time, and let me write that out the disk, and then I, I can free things up. So we will provide you with the class files sort of already set up that are hooked into our disk manager. And the disk manager is the thing that actually does the read and write out to, to disk. You're just sort of implementing the in-memory data structure and all the tracking information. And so the thing that you do need to be careful about in your buffer pool manager is that making sure that you, when you make selections about when you write things out to disk or, or you know, when you want to free up space, that you keep, keep track of when things are actually being pinned correctly. So that means that you need to make sure your buffer pool manager is thread safe. Right? Because if someone comes along and says, I want to pin this page, uh, and then you, you know, you, in between that time, somebody comes along and starts writing data into that page. Sorry, someone comes along and says, I want to pin this page, and then someone else says, I need to make, up, make space, and you go evict that, and then you pin that page and give it back to another thread. But now that w w the, the, the block of the memory that thing is pointing to is now garbage, or now it's some other page that got swapped in, so now you'll, you'll ha your, your database system will, will, will be corrupting itself. So we want to make sure you do this correctly. And again, you can use STD mutex to, to make, this, make this go. So I think uh, what we'll try to do in the, uh, on Autolab, we'll try to do a little uh, sort of micro benchmark to see how fast your implementation actually is. So the cheapest thing to do, that, or the easiest thing to do, is to put STD mutexes everywhere. Uh, but then you're essentially you know, you're pegged to a single thread. So if you're a bit more, you're a bit more uh, sophisticated or nuanced of how you use your, 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 your latches, then you, you, you can get better performance. All right, so to get started, uh, the, the web page is up. The, the, the tarball file for the, uh, for the download is not, not up. We'll do that after the class. Um, we tested this on the Android machines, both in the sort of general pool for the university, as well as the, uh, the SCS ones on the lab on the, the fourth or fifth floor. Um, it also runs on OSX. It runs on ba uh, basic Unix. We, there really aren't any dependencies that we're bringing in. SQLite's designed to run everywhere. And our code that we're providing you guys for, for, for your storage manager should be, pr should be pretty portable. In theory, also, too, is should it compile on Windows 10 uh, using the Ubuntu package? We haven't tried. Um, but if someone tries that and it works, let me know, because we can post that and say this is available for everyone. If it does not work on your laptop or does not work on some kind of Android machine, please send us an email and we, we can figure out what's wrong. It should work. This should be portable. You should not have problems. All right, so other things to note real quickly is that in the project spec, 
It'll tell you which six files you need to modify. You should only modify those six files. If you think you need to modify other things in order to get this thing to work, you're wrong. Trust me. So if you modify the other files other than the sixth one that we tell you to modify, then when, we, when you get the update for the second project, uh, those changes will get overwritten and it'll break, your, it'll break your implementation. The other thing to point out too is that all these projects are cumulative. So that means that you're going to take your buffer pool manager from this project and you're going to use it again for your second project and third project and fourth project. So if you bomb this one, you're in trouble. Right? There's not, because we, we can't provide solutions because we, you know, we want to be able to reuse these projects every single year. So this is essentially what they do in the OS course as well. Uh, it's cruel, but it is what it is. This is CMU, so I think you guys are up for the challenge. Um, and the last thing to also say is that any questions, high level questions about your implementation or clarifications about the project specification, please post on Canvas. That way, if you have a question, somebody else might have the same question, and that way we don't have to answer it multiple times. Um, you can also come to TA, TA office hours and ask other, other things. But we're not going to help you debug your project. That means if you come to office hours and say, I'm hitting a seg fault in your own code, we're not going to teach you how to use GDB and figure out what's going on. OK? Again, this is an upper level course. This is CMU. <laughs> oh, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> OK, sorry. That's on video, too. We'll, we'll, we'll bleep that out. OK. OK, is this clear? So again, everyone should have the, you know, we can't enforce the prerequisites for the graduate students because you're coming from different universities. But for undergrads, 213 is a requirement. And I know how hard 213, 213 is. Uh, so you guys should have the background for this. So you should look at 513, make sure you understand what's going on. OK? So we provided some links on the website of how to debug and use GDB. Look at them, OK? And lastly, Please, 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 please do not plagiarize. I will destroy you, right? Uh, that means you should not find random source code on the internet, which you won't find for this project because it's never been done yet. Uh, and do not just take wholesale copies of them. Now, extendable hash table is 30 years old. There's going to be a lot of implementations out there. So if you, you, know, if you find reference ones you want to use as the basis of yours, I can't stop you. Just please just don't copy code. The other thing that's really important is I ask you not to post your source code of your project implementation on GitHub, both during the semester and after the semester. I realize that a lot of you guys want to do this because you want to post it on your, your CV to help you get jobs. Uh, but please don't do this because then the next people next year will end up find, finding it and copy it. OK? So again, plagiarism will not be tolerated. We'll, you know, we'll kick you out, yada, yada, yada. OK? But I, I'm serious. Like, please don't plagiarize. Yes? So, so his question is, a good hash table requires you to have a good hash function. Absolutely true. SDL hash will be fine. SCD hash is fine. OK? Uh, we're not worried about performance so much for, the, for, the, for these projects. We will care about this in the graduate course. Uh, if you take it in the spring, because we have a real database system, then absolutely right, we care about hash functions. So we use city hash or murmur hash. For this, STL hash is good enough. Right? I can show you some charts where like, it does OK up to a certain key size, and then, and then, and then city hash or murmur hash will beat it. For this, it's fine. Actually, you need to use STD hash for, for, to make sure our tests actually work as well. OK? Any questions? Trust me, normal forms actually are, I don't want to say cool, but uh, they're worth knowing. So we got through today, we'll get through Wednesday, and then we'll get to the good stuff, right? I think of this, you're eating your vegetables, and then we'll get to the actual, you know, the dirty tacos afterwards, okay? All right, we're done. All right, guys, thank you so much.